Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar with Natalie Tan. I'll introduce myself first. I'm Nicole Hilton. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at the Canadian Gift Association. For those of you who don't know me, um, we're very excited to have Natalie with us today. Uh, we hope everyone's been staying safe, of course. Natalie has 25 years experience in specialty retail. So she's gonna chat with you today about keeping those meaningful customer connections either while you've been um, you know, working remotely, maybe your store is closed, perhaps you're doing curbside pickup, but as our country starts to reopen, and I know many provinces have entered that first phase and uh, some are still to come, she's gonna give you some pointers about that as well. I'd also like to mention that she is going to take questions at the end of her session. Um, so if you can hold on to your questions until that time, You'll see the question and chat box on the side of your screen. If you want to test it out right now, why don't you just give us a quick hi, hello, um, and we'll just move on over to Natalie Tan. Thank you so much, and we look forward to your presentation. Hi, Nicole. Am I on now? Loud and clear. Thank Here you, everybody, Natalie. for... Yes? Thank you everyone for joining in today. I really appreciate it. Uh, there's a lot of things that are happening that are beyond our control, but there are also a lot of things that we can do while we have this sort of mini break uh, from everything else. I know as a visual merchandiser, it's very rare for us to get a time when there's nobody in the store that, you know, when we do uh, merchandising or repainting or fixing anything. So I think this is a nice pause for us to look at what we've got right now and how we want to go about with it. So today we're going to talk about your customers and why it's very important to keep a meaningful relationship with them. So to start off, let's talk about why it's very important to actually have this customer connection. One of the things that we talk about in retail and probably many of you have already heard is that this Pareto principle, which is 80-20, 80% of your sales will come from 20% of your loyal customers. So the question now becomes, how do I make for loyal customers? Well, the thing is, constant communication with these customers will eventually make them our loyal customers. Also, just one thing to remember, um, on average, your loyal customers are worth up to 10 times as much as their first purchase from you. Now, don't worry about taking notes because um, this will be, this whole presentation is being taped and it will be readily available on the Can Gift website later. Now, how do we establish deeper relationships with our customer? Most importantly is to show that you care for the customer. Now, some retailers have a database. Some take note of birthdays, milestones. Um, if you don't have that, you know it's Mother's Day is coming up. And if you know they have kids, even just firing off an email, Happy Mother's Day to mothers. Um, or if you want to introduce new products or services. Now, I'm going to go into this uh, later in detail. And I'll show you so many things that you can do to keep in constant communications with your customer. So let's talk about uh, what are some of the detriments to um, shopping visits. Well, what this pandemic has taught me is that not only do I love online shopping, that I actually rely on online shopping. Now, many of you will say, well, isn't that going to uh, make life challenging more for people like me who have uh, brick and mortar stores? Now, let me tell you one thing. While online shopping is great, it's very convenient, it's available 24 seven. Um, I do most of my shopping from 11 o'clock at night onwards, and that's when it's most dangerous. However, a lot of times people still need um, to touch the product unless you're buying something like say toilet paper that you've already bought so many times before and the brand that you're used to. Otherwise, um, the products that you wanna buy, you want to see and touch. 
So here's a, a for example, uh, what are the advantages to shopping at brick and mortar stores? So for example, people still want to see, touch the product, especially if it's a new item. I know that we buy everyday goods online, but if you're shopping for a Mother's Day gift, now that's kind of hard unless you're limiting yourself to maybe flowers, right? So otherwise, brick and mortar stores still have a role to play. Also, there's less hassle when compared to shopping online for things that I might need to return or exchange or the availability of somebody who knows about the product that I could talk to. And most importantly, I think social interaction is still key in a brick and mortar store, right? And this is what physical shopping brings. So what are the current detriments to shop visits? So people will say, well, uh, they still haven't opened up. Local governments are still looking at opening some areas. Right now here in Vancouver, uh, especially in Burnaby, we already opened our golf courses. I mean, that's the first start. However, some provinces like Manitoba, I've heard, uh, it's probably already starting to open this week. Some suburbs of Quebec, not Montreal, is opening. So as Canada slowly opens up, some of the things that we, we look at, uh, you know, people might be concerned about, you know, picking up the virus while they're going out shopping. So security and safety is one of those things that people um, are quite concerned about. However, let's talk about security. A couple of things. One that is um, going to be uh, safe when they go shopping in a brick and mortar store is first of all, cybersecurity, right? There's no way somebody can steal something when you're holding your credit card from you or that when you buy a product, you know that it's not fake, it's a legitimate product. That's one plus for us. Other things that we can do to mitigate people's insecurities about shopping in our store. For example, uh, right now we talk about physical distancing. So unless uh, you know, local governments will come up with a guideline, right now I think it's at six and a half feet of space, or uh, I think it translates to about one person for every 120 square feet of store. So if your selling space is 1,200 square feet, then that means you can probably have at the max 10 people inside your store. And the only requirement is that as soon as you have 10 people inside the store, you might have somebody in front of your um, entrance just to get people to wait until a next person comes out the store. But wouldn't it be a wonderful problem to have more than 10 people at a small store at one given time? At any rate, other things that um, will make them feel safer, uh, floor stickers, you know, for standing in line where it says, please wait here, or signs for physical distancing. Um, we encourage the use of masks. Now, uh, in the beginning, people said masks are no use because they don't protect you. However, what masks do is protect other people from you. And one, one good thing about being a Canadian is that we're all very nice, we're all very respectful. And whenever we go to any public places that has a lot of people in it, we actually put a mask on just as a courtesy to people. Uh, you can have hand sanitizers near the shop entrance and, and maybe putting a uh, plexi or the plastic barriers at the cash desk. Now, one of the things that to keep your own staff safe is you can probably have uh, uh, the, um, uh, I call it the welder's hat, but really it's more like uh, a see-through plastic uh, face shield that you can give them to use, right? Now, the advantage is this, online shopping is and always will be impersonal. It's really a solitary experience. It's not something that you have an interaction with people. And one thing I know for sure, this pandemic has taught a lot of people that social interaction is very important. Now, this is backed by science. Longevity factors include nurturing social circles and human interactions, along with other things like eating healthy, um, sleeping well, reducing chronic stress. 
but human interaction is key. And I think now more than ever, people realize how important it is to be able to talk to someone else. And they don't realize that when they go out to do their shopping on a daily basis, they take it for granted. But now that it's gone, they realize you know, that they miss talking to people outside. Now, what this lockdown experience has led pretty much many of us to uh, reevaluate our values. And I would say that these values have always been there, but I think it's just so much more pronounced now. So when we ask, what do your customers want? So let's take a look at this. Sixty-four percent of customers cited shared values. So what is shared values? It's pretty much values that they have and that as retailers, we show that we also have the same values. And this is a primary reason for creating a very strong relationships and getting them to support us while you, as a member of a community, also support them. So these are the four key values that I thought are very important and very evident right now. Uh, number one, which is good for all of us, is shopping local. Shopping uh, and supporting community merchants. We realize now that um, uh, many closed stores in our downtown core or closed stores in our villages and areas does no good for anybody. So making sure that we support local is important. Number two, buying locally made products, not just supporting our local merchants, but also buying local. Now, this example here I have is for BC farmers, for example. I mean, it's not just limited to food. We can also buy um, locally made products, for example, uh, small businesses that make bath and body products, skincare, um, clothing, and, and the list goes on. So I think a lot of Canadians, while we used to value super low price points, and you still will have those people that will buy uh, based on price. Say, for example, they can go to dollar stores or value price stores. But there's also now a growing number of people who actually don't mind paying the extra because they know it's going to support uh, a local, a uh, small local business or um, a local merchant. Another key value, and I don't want to sound like a broken record here because we've always talked about being green, uh, eco-friendly products, but locally made goods means less transportation, less carbon footprint. We also talk about products that are made of sustainable materials, which is better for the environment. I know we've seen a lot of pictures of the melting glaciers or um, dead whales that wash off and their stomachs are full of plastic. So as soon as we see those pictures, right away we think, what can we do, even in a small part, to save the environment? We also want to see products that are made of local materials, or at the very least, um, ethical or fair trade items which are respectful to working conditions. So these, this for me, this third key value is very important. Now the fourth key value for me is called businesses. Businesses that care for the community, businesses that give back. People come to me and say, well, but Nat, you know, finances are tight these days. The stores are closed. We're not in, making any revenue. How do we give back? Well, it doesn't have to be monetary. It can be something that you can do for the community. And later I'm going to go into it and, and show you how you can even share your efforts to your loyal customers. So now that we know the four key values, let's take a look at how do we then share this to our customer and let them know that this is what we're doing. I want you to communicate to your customers that you're eager for your business to come back and you're looking forward to them coming back and visiting you. So first things first, social media. I know everybody says social media, but for me nowadays, 
this is really a non-negotiable. And what I mean by a non-negotiable is this is one of the easiest ways and practically free um, ways for you to merchandise, uh, to, sorry, to, to show your merchandise to your customers, to uh, convey to your customers your brand identity, who you are, and what your values are. So some things that you can do weekly emails and just make sure in those emails there's a way out for people who don't want to receive your emails and in Canada we have a law that says that you cannot just um, pick up any email you need permission from people to um, to send them emails and one of the things that uh, retailers do is um, have a database and as people are paying just say you know would you like to uh, receive uh, coupons or discounts or or hear about the upcoming sales that we have and we'll send you emails and you know uh, that's one way of getting uh, their contact information another way is if you don't do the email route is be on social media whether well depending on your um, age group of customers right so it could be on Facebook it could be on Twitter on Pinterest um, on Instagram on WeChat or if you're so inclined to be on TikTok, right? So depending on your um, age group of customers, you will want to be where they are, or better yet, just be on all of them. Because for example, there are now uh, ways that you could blast out an email and at the same time, it automatically uploads to all your, all your social media. For example, um, I don't mean to plug them, but uh, MailChimp, for example, uh, is what I use and when I send out an email uh, you know you have a choice do you want to put that on your Facebook page on your um, Instagram and on your Twitter so ju that just makes it so much easier now another thing before I forget if you're not the type to take a photo of an item and post it or write about it or a couple of sentences you could just as easily pick an item up and say for example here Video log yourself, just say, oh, we got this new product in and tell people why it's very important or what it can do to enhance their lives, uh, feature and benefits of the product. Now, on this slide that you see, uh, this is an example from a client of mine from a live health center. And I'm quite proud about uh, what they've done. So they would either introduce a new product or you know, uh, pick up a, a feature item and they will tell people uh, about the product, how it can um, add to their wellness, uh, the feature benefits of the item, um, you know, or you might pick up an item in your store that, you know, is eco-friendly and it's something that you might want to introduce. Uh, this post, for example, here by Alive is done on Instagram. Now, another type of item that you could do is you might have an item in there that's been sitting in your store for a while. Well, why don't you make it a feature item? For example, uh, you can have a photo of it um, on your social media, uh, just one item, or you can have a range of items like this photo that I have right now that's showing from Small Potatoes Bazaar. Um, they're a small company they are actually a beautiful retail store right in Pemberton, BC. And one of the things that uh, we, we can feature, for example, is Mother's Day. Uh, this display fits perfectly not only for Mother's Day, but also for springtime, right? So nowadays, uh, you might want to highlight items that you carry that might be in short supply elsewhere or you know, during this lockdown, people are looking for products that make for a healthy home, like essential oils, diffusers, scented products, bath and body, um, nesting at home, pillows, blankets, throw pillows. Now, I don't know about you, um, I probably am gaining a lot of weight during this lockdown because we think about, okay, we're at home the whole day, what am I gonna eat next? I don't know how many of you do, but you probably bake your best sourdough bread ever, and there's no uh, yeast to buy anywhere else in any grocery store, so I can't make any bread. But things like if you carry bakeware or cookware or anything for the garden, anything for the home, 
that you think people might um, might use. Feature that item on your social media, right? Now, another thing, if you're helping in the community, uh, feature that out. Tell people what you're doing. Uh, if you're delivering meals to frontline health workers, or better yet, if you're baking cookies or 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 cooking something and bringing it to the frontliners, uh, feature that. Um, if you have, for example, uh, a promotion going on uh, for Mother's Day, be it uh, probably not on a physical store, but maybe online. Say, for example, you might feature a skincare product or a clothing item or whatever you have in your retail store that you might contribute a percentage of your profits to uh, a community cost, you know, feature that. Um, it's something that people would like to, to know. And by the way, right now, when people are staying at home, they have a lot of time to go through social media. As you know, the internet usage has gone up and that's what people are doing. So this is the best time to be on Facebook, on Pinterest, on Instagram, or on any social media platform that you use. Now, another thing, and this is something I actually like to see uh, for some stores that I patronize. For example, um, getting to know uh, the, the owner and the team members. Um, for example, um, playing a tourist in their own backyard. They might just take a photo of you know, the area they live in and, and talk about it or if they have special interests like baking, they might bake a bread and take a photo of it and, and share it. Uh, it's not necessarily selling something from your store, but just letting them know a little bit about you, about your team members. If you've watched a movie recently that you loved or a book that you've read, share it. Let them know that this is what's happening and this is what you're doing. Of course, if you have a sale, a promo, it's something that you might want to promote on all your social media. So this is an example from a live health center. They have a one day only online promo. So for example, 10% off, it doesn't have to be much, you know, just get out there um, because people are spending so much time on the internet right now. And this is really a call to support uh, a local merchant or to support your store. Here's another thing. Um, your blog or your um, uh, post need not be, again, selling anything. It should just be an article that would be of interest to your customers. For example, at Alive, they will say, boost your immune system naturally and stay safe from viruses and the flu. And, you know, it's just, five things that you can do at home. So you might be able to actually come up and you know, write five things that people can do at home to, to, um, uh, to, to stay healthy or, or five ways to clean the, the air inside your homes. Now, this one I like a lot. It's pretty much a um, call for interaction. And this is something that you can do because it will get your customers moving and involved with you. So, you know, it doesn't have to cost a lot. We know that posting an ad in the paper can probably cost $500 and up. Well, this will probably cost you, I don't know, $50. Uh, get something in your store. Again, I just borrowed Small Potatoes Bazaar in Pemberton, uh, where they have a line of products that is from Salt Spring Island. And so again, this is for us here in BC, supporting a small business, a community-based business. And you can just say, vote for your favorite scent. And the winning um, scent, you'll pick up a person's name and they win, I don't know, a set or basket of, of uh, skincare products, right? So that will get people involved and all they have to do is reply to your post, like, uh, you know, somebody might reply on Facebook, lavender, or on Instagram, people might just reply, oh, I love the rosemary, rosemary mint uh, scent. So get people interacting with you. So this is one of the key things I always tell people. If you can get your customers to respond to your post, that's the best thing. That's, that's worth its weight in gold. Now, uh, when you're organizing your store ready for your customer's return, right? 
feature that out, post pictures of uh, displays that you've done. For example, on the, the photo on the left is from Flyover Canada. They have a new line of products come in and they've just displayed that up. Uh, you know, it's just waiting for customers to come in. Take a photo, or again, the photo on the right-hand side is from Small Potatoes Bazaar in Pemberton, it's a display that was done. Feature that, put that out. You can also, lastly, let them know what you're doing to clean your store, right? I mean, you can have a picture of yourself uh, wiping down surfaces or wiping baskets with disinfectant, uh, putting the stickers, putting the barriers uh, by your uh, cash desk or installing stickers on your floor. Take a photo of that, feature that, and post that in your social media. It gives people a reassurance that you are aware of what's happening and you have the same concerns as them. Now, I know I don't have a lot of time, but I just want to give you key pointers. Again, this is going to be available on the Canned Gifts webinar website. So you don't have to take notes if you don't want to. But if you're reopening soon, let me give you seven tips. This is the perfect time to do it. As I mentioned, there's not a whole lot of people um, in the store. In fact, it's empty, it's perfect. This is the perfect time to do it. So number one, in your displays, make sure that you build emotional connections. Now, isn't this picture lovely? As soon as we finish the display, this kid comes and hugs a product. Okay, now I don't know if it's something we want customers to do during this pandemic and touching everything and hugging it. However, this is what I mean. This is a visual of an emotional connection. Um, let me give you an example. If you take a look at this next slide and the photo that you see, the, the first two pictures on the left-hand side, products are pretty much merchandised by end use. What do I mean by end use? So for example, tea towels. Uh, the tea towels are all grouped together. The canisters are all grouped together. Um, you know, cups and mugs are grouped together. That's one way of merchandising. However, when we merchandise products this way, um, it's harder or it's more challenging to increase my multiple sales. However, one way to elevate perceived product values and one way to increase the chances of multiple selling is merchandising by story. And this is the photo on the right hand side. And it shows you now that I, I actually took some of the items, as you can see on the first two photos that I encircled and used it to create this display on the right hand side. It's so much more attractive. There's a lot of impact. Uh, they actually come from different suppliers, but it gives the impression that it belongs to one group. So if somebody's interested in the apron, the next thing you go, oh, I didn't know that it has a matching lunch box, or oh, I didn't know it has a matching mug or a water bottle. So it encourages multiple selling in one area and just one customer looking at one glance right away on multiple selling many items. So this is what I mean by emotional connection. Here's another example. Take a look at the photo up top. Um, all the serveware uh, dishes and bowls are grouped together. But the photo down below shows I've actually separated all of them and grouped them by stories. So the encircled uh, pieces, I put them and created a story of, you know, shabby chic, right? Uh, giving you the impression of blues and whites and all that serene feeling. And they're all grouped together. So you may not be in a market to buy, I don't know, a pillow but because it's merchandise adjacent to the shabby chic um, plates and dishes and, and um, flowers, next thing you know, you're probably buying and picking up a pillow because it goes together, right? So that's one thing, make an emotional connection. Number two, please make it easy to shop. Now, taking a look at that smaller photo on the left-hand side, that is the before. We did not increase our square footage. And this often, this actually often um, happens whenever we do a store. Uh, we did not increase the square footage. We also uh, did not reduce the amount of merchandise. We simply organized and created clear walk paths. Do you see the difference between the two? And notice the amount of signage also in that before photo. 
I'm going to show you later that um, all those signs, all the communications is still being uh, imparted to customers even in this new space. And I'll show you later how we did it. But right away, you can see I would go inside that store because I'd feel safe with physical distancing. Right. So that's number two. Number three, please keep your product categories tight and well organized. And this is what I mean. What are product categories? Well, mentioned earlier that you could merchandise your product by end use, but you could also very well merchandise your products by stories. And this is a store in actually in Washington state. And um, if you take a look at the two smaller photos on the left hand side, you will see the before. And the owner comes and tells me, you know, um, I'm full to bursting. I have a storage full of merchandise and I don't know how to um, make it look good. I don't know how to fit everything. So I sent her to, I, I, you probably all know this already. I sent her to Ikea because you probably recognize the Billy bookcases in there. So at the end, she spent $355 creating these bookcases and we merchandised all her products including all the products she has in storage and we even could merchandise more so that's just an example of how we organize product categories uh, on the uh, after photo if you take a look at the first segment on the left side of this photo those are all wedding uh, related items followed by cocktail items and then followed by garden party items and then the the right most is beach party items. So somebody comes in who's not interested in the beach party, but is interested in hosting a cocktail. Well, they go to that cocktail section, right? So that's just one way of organizing the store without spending a whole lot of money. And at the same time, creating a clear walking path. Now, this example of number four, it's very important. Show products in use. There are some products that are hard to show in use. And here's an example um, of a project that I've done here in Steveston, which is an area in Richmond, BC. They sell um, high-end uh, therapeutic grade essential oils. And these are really great. However, it's very hard to sell unless you have interaction with the customer. So in this case, we use a lot of signage. And just by looking at the big posters alone, it conveys what the product can do for the customer, which is healthy, happy living, right? Number five. Now, this is a pet peeve of mine. You have a store you want to sell to your customers. Can you please make sure that it's easy to buy from you? So on the first photo on the left-hand side, the shoes were displayed way over my head. How the heck am I going to see the styles? I, you know, I'm not going to pull down each shoe to take a look at what it looks, right? So that's lost sales. I don't have to explain the second middle photo. I mean, right now with physical distancing, this hardly works. And the photo on the right hand side, it's so sad because the products it's covering make it un, um, inaccessible. And to think that those products have a higher margin than the slippers that were just put in front. Now, one last pet peeve, if I may. I, when I go purchase clothing, whether it's jeans or t-shirts, and it's on a wall display, small sizes are always displayed on the topmost shelf, followed by medium, large, extra large, and XXL, probably all the way down to the floor. Now, being a short person, I usually buy smaller or medium. And it's really difficult for a short person like me to reach something on the top shelf. Likewise, the large, extra large person, it's probably a tall person. It's probably hard for them to crouch down and pick their item up. So whenever you're displaying anything, make sure that items are easily accessible. On the wall, small items go on eye level. Uh, medium items go on waist level. And then large, big, bulky items go below it. Right? So that's just some example of making it easy. Now, last couple of things. I mentioned earlier about signs. So at that the live store, you saw the before with all the hanging posters. At that point, people are not sure if they're ready to buy. So place your signs where they need to see it. For example, uh, if you want to let people know that you uh, recycle the bottles that they bring back or 
if, uh, if they buy in multiples, they get a discount. Well, place it next to your product, not on a big poster right by entering. Because when they enter your store, they haven't made a decision to buy. So why say buy six when they haven't even made a decision to buy one? So signage, there's a hierarchy for it. All, I, all you have to do is go to your local Tim Hortons or McDonald's. Take a look at people. Their heads are tilted six to eight feet up high because they're looking at the menu board. And then the next sign is happening right by the cash desk where it says, upsize your drink for 50 cents. And then um, you take your tray, you're not ready yet, uh, but when you go pick up your napkins and straws and whatever, there's a sign that says desserts. And then you go sit down, there's a sign that says, um, you know, these are our new menu items. And then the tray liner tells you all about the company's history. So that's what we call a sign hierarchy. Likewise, in retail, we also have a sign hierarchy. And I always tell people, if you don't have the budget right now to redo your entire store, invest in signs. It's something that you can print, hopefully that you can print inside a store. And signs will always sell for you. This is the least investment for the largest return that you can get. Now, last, before we go into our Q&A, lighting. I don't know about you. But as I grow wiser in age, uh, my eyes crave more light. And so lighting is very important for me. In retail, um, it's very inexpensive to invest in track lighting. And for me, they make the best light. There's three levels of lighting. The brightest light go on your focal points and displays. Uh, secondary lights light up your wall that frame the merchandise that's displayed there by the way we never light the floor and then third are just spillover lights but if you take a look at these examples I I probably will have a hard time looking or buying items right now I know that my hands are way shorter than before because I now have to push items further away to read the fine print so be cognizant of lighting inside your store. Take a look at it. Walk inside your store with new eyes. Keep in mind the things that I mentioned. I know there's a lot of them, but out of the seven, pick one if you can't do all of them uh, during this time that it's still quiet and people are not in the store yet. Okay, so also don't forget your part of your housekeeping when you clean your store. Check your light bulbs. Are some of them uh, need changing and make sure you change them and that your products are lit okay so that's about it I know uh, I've, I've taken nine minutes more than the half an hour but we're ready to go for um, Q&A time so Nicole hey, if you're ready hi I'm back uh, just ready to take people's questions uh, thank you so much for all of your tips I mean you have so much wisdom uh, in the retail world that this has been a really great presentation for everyone. I've had comments coming in already. Thank uh, you. So I'll just begin. We have a question here from Carolyn and she says that she is a baby and maternity store. Um, and so that's very high touch. They're often asked to hold customers' babies, to fit carriers, to fit bras. Um, how do you suggest that they can adjust? Because a lot of these social distancing barriers uh, seem like counterintuitive in a nurturing space that they're used to creating for people. Exactly. However, one of the things that you have to keep in mind now is they probably won't be um, handing you their baby baskets because they themselves are cognizant of the physical distancing. Um, the high touch items, I know this is taboo here in North America, but uh, coming from Asia, a lot of our products are actually in plastic bags. And when I first came to Canada, I said, you know, um, I need to bring this uh, touchy feely in Asia because people want to touch the product. Well, what ends up happening is we would have one item out for people to touch and feel. And then the rest of the items are in plastic bags. I know you know, it's counterintuitive to the touchy feely, and I don't want to display items that are in plastic bags. However, I think nowadays uh, with people being, um, you know, unsure of an item, uh, I mean, when we get mail, we even go, should I put it out for three days before I touch it? So my, my suggestion is for products, 
maybe have one item out for people to touch and then the rest uh, in their original packaging, right? I mean, it's counterintuitive, but right now before we get a vaccine, I think that's something that uh, people will welcome instead of saying, you know, why are they putting things in plastic? Mm -hmm. And for had, um, for handing uh, baby baskets over to you or having their, to hold their babies, they probably won't do it now. They probably uh, give them a space. If you have, say, a sitting area, maybe they can put the baby bassinet or uh, the baby basket down there uh, within sight when they try something on. What do you think as well about easing a return policy on some of those items, like maybe a carrier or a bra that previously you'd really have to touch the customer or the baby to see if it's a good fit? Maybe that's a good way to just um, bridge that gap for now. Well, I know that um, a lot of stores now, you know this, when you go to grocery stores, they, they're not accepting any returns. Mm -hmm. um, same thing for, you know, it, it's difficult for the bra items. Um, if they try it on and then give it back to you, um, most of the time we would just put it back in a hanger. But uh, I don't know if the fabric will go for this, but we, we spray a lot of stuff with uh, disinfectant, right? So I don't know, you know, if that will ruin the material. Um, otherwise, it's it's one of those tough ones where, you know, not unless, you know, we can address the issue. Uh, but I think a lot of people that will go buy from you will also be cognizant of the issue. So I don't think they will just, you know, before we would try, and this is research, we would try four pairs of jeans and buy one. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, again, having one item out to try on and the rest in packages uh, might help, right? So, but right now, until the local government comes up with some guidelines and rules and regulations for us, you know, it's one of those things that we have to wait. But I know for a fact, if it's something that you can disinfect, go ahead and disinfect it. Great points. Okay, we have a ton of questions coming in. So I'll just move on to the next one for you, Natalie. Uh, what is the best way to tell a customer that you have reached maximum capacity and that they will need to please wait before they can enter and shop? What are some of the words that you would suggest using in that situation? Wow, that's a wonderful problem to have, isn't it? So um, if somebody, um, if you're already, for example, the maximum amount of uh, people inside your store, have one of your team members or yourself go out to the door and say, by the way, I'm so sorry, so many people are inside the store right now. I know you're eager to walk in, um, but if you don't mind, just you know, wait for a few minutes, we'll have somebody coming out, they're just paying, right? So number one, do eye contact, you need to talk to them, let them know that their wait time is finite, that there's an end for it, let them know that somebody's waiting uh, to pay and you're processing it, and that they're ready to come out and then they can come in. And then if there's other people at the back of the line, do your eye contact, say hi, say hello to all of them. Great suggestions. Okay, um, Anna Maria was wondering, just going back to the end of your presentation there where you talked about lighting, um, and I will comment that we have never had someone give a webinar that is in such great light themselves. So I know this is a very important point because you <laughs> have mastered it. Um, she is just wondering, you mentioned a few different types of lighting and she missed the third type. Could you just remind her what that, that the types of lighting were? Okay, so basically it's not a type of lighting, but rather the ABC of lighting. A lighting um, is the brightest light. So most of the time, if you have track light, this is what we call our spotlights, right? Our PAR 20s. Uh, these are small concentrated light that hits a display. That's your brightest light. B lighting refers to how you light your wall, for example. And now we use what we call flood lamps. And I think these are PAR 38s. But these flood lamps, we try to crisscross on our wall. That way we eliminate shadows. So this is your B type of lighting. C lighting is basically what we call spillover. Spillover just means that whenever we light our space, whether uh, it's task lighting uh, right above our cash desk, any spillover, that's just the C lighting. Your most important lighting is A and B, right? So uh, just make sure that the 
you know, your light is concentrated on items that you're not, you're selling, not on those that you're not selling. For example, I see stores that light their floor and I don't understand why they light their floor because you're not selling your tiles, are you? Or your wood floors. So spillover lighting actually is what goes in there, not, you know, not light directed on it. So hopefully that helps. Okay, great. Again, we still have about eight questions um, that are coming in right now. So we'll keep going through them with yeah. all of the different types of social media posts. How do you suggest maintaining cohesion? Do you have an example of a retailer that you like that's doing this successfully? And that's coming in from Aaron. Okay, Aaron. So the example a, a while ago that I gave of a live help, that's one example uh, that keeps everything cohesive. One, by the way, that's a good question because I want you to understand people need to sell only one idea at a time. And that's because customers only will buy and process one idea at a time. So for example, with a live health food store, if for example, the post this week is on um, I know elderberry juice and its health benefits. So from their Facebook to Instagram, to Pinterest, to whatever media they use, they use exactly the same picture and the same text. That's the safest way to go about it. Now, in keeping consistent with your brand ID, I would use one background uh, style or one style of display, if you can, um, for all the times. That way, it, it's consistent. I hope that helps. Aaron, if you have more questions, you can always email. I'll give you an example. Perfect. We've got a question from Lisa. Um, I actually have one thought on this one and I'll flip it to you as well, Natalie. She's wondering where you can purchase the floor stickers for physical distancing. I was just going to jump in to let her know that one of the members and exhibitors of the Canadian Gift Association uh, does produce these items. Uh, the company name is Eddie's Hangup Correct. Displays. Yeah. yeah, and we actually have an e-blast coming out two retailers that receive our e-blasts that um, do buying at our shows. It's slated to come out later this week to detail that information. So if you're on our e-newsletter list, you'll be receiving that. And Natalie, did you have any further thoughts about um, where people can purchase these floor stickers? Actually, the examples that I use um, in my webinar are all from Eddie's. So Eddie's has them all in. They have the plexi barriers, they have the floor stickers, uh, they also have masks coming in and the last email I got from them yesterday told me that they actually also have the face shields coming in. So Eddie's hang up there in, I think they're in Toronto, they have Edmonton and of course here in Vancouver. Fantastic. Um, this is coming in from Rosanna. Do you have any thoughts on how to handle trying on shoes or clothing? Kind of similar to your example earlier um, about the baby products. Yeah, shoes, you know, it's not so much of an issue, right? Uh, the clothing, again, disinfecting the clothing if you can. If it's a fine, um, delicate material, you know, it, it's a judgment call. If it's a high price point, um, you know, you might, depending on the customer, if they have uh, already a few items on hand, you might be there to assist them while they try it on. Um, you know, it, it's it's you know it's one of those that's hard. If you can disinfect, disinfect. Also, one thing that I failed to mention: masks are very important because um, right now, if you wear a mask and you cough, uh, you know your projectile goes about 12 inches. Whereas if you don't have a mask, the projectile goes up to six and a half feet, and that's why we have our physical distancing. So when people are trying something on maybe encourage the use of masks so they they don't um you know they don't contaminate the items but you still have to remember that uh a lot of people don't have the virus right um and it's still safe to try things on but you just want to be on the safe side and ask people or encourage the use of masks uh just to follow up to that question is uh somebody is asking uh, what would you use to disinfect clothing if, if they're trying on a t-shirt or something like that? Okay, I don't know if this is right, but this is what I do uh, when I go out. Um, I'm wearing my uh, coat jacket or a shirt. Um, I use a Lysol spray and I just, 
you know, spread. I know that a friend of mine said they have friends in Italy where you know how the virus is just really um, uh, bad over there. Uh, the practice there is before they come home, they actually remove their coats, jackets, whatever they're wearing, hats, including their shoes, and they Lysol them mm -hmm. before they go inside the, the home. So um, aerosol sprays off Lysols, boy, am I being environmentally friendly. Uh, but uh, yeah, disinfectant sprays, or um, I use the wipes and I actually wipe my shoes with them. Right. So I guess if you're a store and you have, you know, one of each size out for sample, and then you're keeping uh, in a plastic package in the back, like you suggested earlier, then you may have to just sacrifice those sample items for try on to the ones that you continually disinfect. Correct. Yes. And then um, also, even if they're in plastic bags, they don't have to be at the back of the store. They can be outside in front of the store because right now I think people kind of understand why they're in plastic. I agree. And I think people would also take that plastic home and do their own wipe down when they get it home. So exactly. uh, just following the same questioning line, do you have any thoughts on UV disinfectant wands for oh, clothing? I actually have them. Um, I've used the handheld ones when I go and stay at hotels. And I know that studies have come out that they kill about, they're not 99.9, .9, but they're like 97.8, which is still great. So if you can get your hands on uh, UV light, there's, uh, I know that there are some big ones that are probably 18 inches long that are, I just saw it on my email, they're about $36. And you can invest in those and just use UV light. Actually, that's a very good idea. Thank you uh, for, to disinfect anything inside the store. Great idea. Okay, we have Tracy here. She has a jewelry store, so a bit of a different angle on the products that she sells. Um, her best selling items are rings. Uh, she is already planning to have wipes and sanitizers available, but she's trying to figure out the best way to do business. Having just one item out is not an option for her. Now, jewelry being of metal, and it's something that you can clean. I wouldn't do anything differently from before. I would still have them all out and people encourage people to try them on. You can always disinfect them after. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, here's a question too coming in from the clothing angle. Um, this person is Holly. Hi, Holly. And she has a consignment store um, and she is allowed to reopen on May 11th for curbside. And wow. she's wondering if when people come to do their pickups with her, should everyone wear gloves when they're interacting with her? Okay, so this is my advice, just to keep uh, Holly and her team safe. Um, if I owned that business, I would have a mask, I would have a face shield, I'd be wearing gloves, just to be on the safe side, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we have Mary. Mary has an online Christmas store. It goes wow. without saying that most people are not thinking of Christmas at this time. Without appearing to be overly optimistic, is there any way of promoting her business um, while people have the time to visit her website? Yes, absolutely. Um, I worked with a company before that they only pop up during the Christmas season. But what are what's happening between uh, the Christmas season and and between now and then, right? If you're doing your buying, let them know where you are. Uh, feature an item, just say, coming this December, uh, this is the trend. Talk about colors, talk about um, display ideas. Uh, not just, uh, it doesn't have to be product centric, but it can be, um, this is what I saw, the trend in, in uh, drapery uh, that will match, um, you know, uh, decorations that you will have this Christmas. Right, so talk about trends. Uh, Christmas decorations basically fall under home fashions. And when we talk about fashions, there's always so much to think about. So colors, uh, styles, shapes, um, uh, methods, strategies. So anything, just to give an idea of how to. It doesn't have to be the product itself. It can also be what is she doing right now? Where is she going? How is she doing her buying that she can't travel right now? Mm -hmm. um, we have a question coming in from Matt. He's saying terrific information. This presentation has really helped him out. 
Um, could you spend a little bit of time reviewing a few of the many successful ways of interacting with customers when they're in the store? Uh, he says, I'm sure there are some basic things that can be done for safe interaction. Okay, thanks, Matt. So when I um, hear this question about how can we have better interaction inside a store, is that the question? Yes. Okay, so inside the store, we have what we call our non-negotiables. And I know that people always say, well, I don't want to be sold to, which is great. I don't want to be sold to either. But we have actually non-negotiable steps. As soon as a customer walks in, greet them, right? However, when they walk around, we leave them alone. We don't immediately attack them. We ask them, you know, take your time, look around. And once they pick an item up, that's when we approach them. Approach is a very important step because it then leads away to a conversation with a customer. When they pick an item up, talk about the item. Don't, um, you know, uh, it's not being pushy, it's just sharing information. For example, I picked a pen up. Isn't that a wonderful color? Um, it's made of, I don't know, titanium and talk about the product, something that's non-threatening. And then ask open-ended questions, find out about them. Don't just tell them about the product. So uh, what type of pens do you normally use? Um, you know, do you like uh, gel ink? You know, I, I am, I'm using a pen as an example, right? So get their interaction going. Ask them questions, what they're going to use it for. Um, and then you can suggest items. So while this is happening, uh, the customer feels that you really care about their concern. And at the same time, you are promoting the products that you have inside your store. And once they've locked in on a pen, the next item is, for us anyways, it's multiple selling. What items can you introduce with a pen that will enhance that customer's life? And then we address any concerns they have, we thank them. And then at the end, um, you know, before we say thank you, by the way, most of the time, it's the customer that thanks us instead of us thanking them. And that's because when you hand them the bag, they say thank you, and then that's it, right? So make sure you thank your customer. You give them a reason to come back. Right. Whether it's saying, by the way, next weekend, you know, um, I'll have this new shipment come in. Um, if they're willing, tell them, you know, whenever I have a new shipment come in, would you like to know about it? I'll send you an email about it. Right. So then that's a start. Or another way to get emails while they're in a store is holding a contest. Right. When you have a contest to win something, um, people will, uh, give us your email, but also make sure that um you have a, a a note in there that giving us your email gives us the right to send you um uh, notifications for promotions right so that's one thing but um uh, if you'd like to get to know more about the steps of the non-negotiable steps email me uh info uh i'll give you the the steps because that's one way to connect to a customer but at the same time you're promoting your products um you know, we just have a couple more minutes, Natalie. So uh, we do have a couple more questions. I'll go through them very quickly. Uh, Jacqueline is saying she has a custom upholstered furniture workshop and showroom um, business. Now she's asked a couple questions about disinfecting and fabrics and things, but I think we've touched on that already as best as we can. Um, she is also just wondering about sanitizing stations. You know, a lot of stores, like if you go to the grocery store now, sometimes you see those out front. Um, any thoughts on those or where you could possibly get those? Basically, a sanitizing station, all you need is, if you, depending on your store, if you have a sink and soap, that's great. If not, make sure you have um, all the hand sanitizers in one place. Also, if you eventually, I'm sure the masks are going to come out inexpensively the way they cost before, which is $10 for like a box of, I don't know, 100 That what that's what it cost before. Um, I would have that out. I would have some gloves out. So you're giving people an option to actually use them while they're inside your store. So if you could put them right up front, if you can have a table, um, have the disinfectant um, hand uh, disinfectant there, have the gloves, have uh, the masks there if you can. Uh, we do have Wilma and Hal wondering if it's acceptable for them to ask their customers to wear masks and gloves that they will provide. 
Okay, now we've seen so much news about this in the US and it's sad that yesterday um, a security guard was shot simply because he's asked somebody why they're not wearing a mask. Now, I have more faith in Canadians and I think that the reason why our country has been one of the more successful countries in controlling this virus is because we respect each other. Not so much that, oh, because this politician said we should do it and that's why we're doing it. I think we're doing it for our own community. So uh, making sure that your signage, the tone of signage is a positive one. Um, you know, I'm not a frontliner, but this is the most that I can do. I'll wear a mask, you know. Uh, frontliners are giving up their lives or, or they're, they're risking their lives uh, with this pandemic. And this is the least I could do is put a mask on or wear gloves, right? So make sure the signage is very positive and set the stage already so that people are thinking, oh, this is a small thing that I can do to contribute to my community, right? Yeah. So just phrase it that way. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, it's a strange time for everyone, right? It's not just the people who are shop owners or retail owners um, that are worried about all of this, but the customers are worried too. Um, so I'm, I think it's a, a good time for everyone to come together and see different perspectives and, and, you know, adhere to what needs to be done and what people are asking. So um, with that said, Natalie, we've hit our three o'clock mark. Um, maybe you could remind everyone again how they can get in touch with you and what your website is if they'd look, like to look up more information about you. And I'll remind everyone that there will be a recording of this webinar on our website as soon as humanly possible. Okay, thanks, Nicole. If you have any questions, regardless anything about this webinar or any question about your store, if you want to send me a photo of your store, you're more than welcome to. My email is info, I-N-F-O, at natalietan.com. My website is the same. It's just natalietan.com. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your inviting me, Nicole, and I appreciate everyone attending this webinar. Fantastic. Uh, we had quite the audience here with us today. So uh, lots of questions came in. I'm sure everyone got a ton of information out of this. And we certainly appreciate you taking the time. You've worked with the Canadian Gift Association for so many years now um, that we always value what you have to say. And your retail experience always shines through. So thanks for giving us some light on the situation that we're in today. Thanks, Nicole. Okay. Take care. Everybody stay well. Thank you.